leave at uh, seven o'clock. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And uh, we will start with the review of the agenda and any adjustment changes or additions. I do have a couple uh, changes. Uh, one, I'd like to provide an update on our job search uh, for candidates for the, the public work supervisor. Uh, then we, I'd also like to uh, kind of have an update and a discussion about the social media policy. And uh, we've also received a request from the historical society about uh, staff support. All right. Um, do you think that the uh, job search for a public works supervisor should should go into the uh, public works super in association with the with the supervisor's report or later? Uh, I can do it in the supervisor's report. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any items? Thanks. Yes. Um, I would like if. Uh, with your approval, I'd like to earlier in the meeting give a just a quick a quick COVID response update. Uh, update. Uh, it involves staffing, so I want to inform the board. Okay. Um, all right. I'll see when we can slip that in. I, Kyle. I'm all set. Okay. Um, so the next item would be the review and approve the minutes of the past meetings, uh, which I have as October 19th. On the 28th we have the Octo of, of October, we had the Board of Abatement and a regular meeting uh, and November 2nd. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on how to proceed with those? I'm happy to move the slate. Okay. Uh, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I would have one, suggest one change. Well, do, do other people have any changes? Doug. Mike? I'll let you get, finish up with this and I wanna go back to the additions. Okay. Um, the, on October, uh, boy, the October 19th one, um, I think on page 10, there was a uh, discussion with regard to Kate Lally, and I said that she was donating. Actually, LCPC was paying for, uh, I don't believe I said that, I said we've received this because LCPC is donating that and they are compensating her. So that's the only change in that. Uh, would uh, you accept that as a friendly uh, amendment? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So any, any discussion further? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. The ayes have it. Uh, Mike? I don't see on our agenda, but we're going to discuss the October 2020 Sheriff's Report. That is, uh, uh, I did omit it from the agenda. You're right. Uh, but I believe that you've received it. So, right. Uh, we can... I'd like to read something into the minutes from that report. Okay. All right. I'll add that to the agenda. Mike, is that the one we just received today? Yes. Okay. The 2021, October, yeah. 2020. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the one we received today. Okay. That was not the one I was thinking of. No, that, that one's okay. I just want to make a point with this one here. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so then, Rosemary, the uh, treasurer's report and review of the uh, bills, warrants, licenses. Okay, on the budget status report, um, we have not received our pilot money from the state, we usually receive that around November 1st. 
and it's a little bit late this year. And expenditures to date are at twenty nine percent spent up budget. And on the orders, we are paying the school their second installment. And that's the major thing on the orders. And I sent you guys a list of all the delinquent taxpayers. Um, I'm not sure if you're gonna want to um, send them to the attorney for a collection in December or you, do you wanna wait until after the pandemic is over? Well, Mike? A lot of other towns have continued on with their delinquent taxes and They've had tax sales and everything. I, I begin to think that Johnson's one of the few towns in the county that hasn't had a tax sale this year for delinquent taxes. We have not had one this year. Right, and I think we're one of the few that has not had one because it seems like I've read a, a number of them in the News and Citizen. I think we should get on it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. How does the current delinquent tax compare with other years at this time? It's higher. By a lot, a little? Uh, it's probably 20% higher. 20%. Mike? It should be noted though that those going up for tax sale were, were not really actually part of this pandemic, I would assume. Is that correct, Rosemary? Well, anything after um, July, uh, May 10th. Right, but the vast majority of those were delinquent way before the pandemic. Yes, some of them were, yes, because some of them yeah. haven't paid any taxes at all for yeah. last year. Right, but the pandemic would certainly <laughs> make it even more difficult. Um, True. It uh, increases the burden on the rest of us, though. So I, I think I agree with Mike. It's my recollection that with this came up last month and we passed on it, and uh, you know, here we are uh, to look at it again and. I, I'm in agreement with uh, Nat on that, that uh, it, it is a burden and, and we do treat this as if it's cash in our, in our bank account. So is there a motion with regard to that? So move, Mr. Chairman. And the motion would be to send this to the tax collector? Is that, yes. Is that, Brian, what we would be looking for? I'd ask Rosemary sp for the specifics, but uh, I believe so. Yes. Okay, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Further discussion? How would this be done? Vir uh, virtually or? Good question. That's a good question. We can move forward with this and then we can tighten that up. I can uh, refer to those ones in the paper and see how they went about it. Well, when an actual tax sale happens, it's like a, an auction. Right. So it could so be done virtually. It must have been an auction online, it must have been a Zoom auction. How many people show up? I mean, I've been to one and I think there were five people in the room. Sometimes there's only one. Sometimes it's only Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you ever get 20? Oh, no, never. <laughs> you throw me under the bus again. Yeah. No, it's true. The one and only I've been to, you were the only one there. That was the exception, not the rule. Okay. Um, for online or in person, I, I do think that's a bridge we can cross later uh, when it 
actually comes up for sale, uh, we'll do ha we will have a little bit of time to do some planning with whoever we uh, contract with for the sale. The, the attorney that we work with will presumably come with a plan. If they don't already have a plan that we're satisfied with, we can work with them to improve it. It's my recollection that we've been using Angela Ross uh, for, for these tax sales. That's correct. Yes. Do we need to be specific about that, uh, Rosemary, as to who we would use as an attorney? Not unless you want to change it. Okay. So remind me how this works. If if we vote this through, <clears throat> is there an appeal process for those for folks, or is it a done deal? Like if they said, "Hey," came back and said, "Hey, there's real hardship here." Um, can we? We would work, we would work on with them the best they could before when okay. the front sale. We'll send them, you know, the, the final letters. Say yeah. how much it is, and if they want to avoid any additional charges, they should make payment arrangements. Okay, good to know. Thank you. So, uh, is there any further discussion? So, it's my recollection that we had a motion and a second. So, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, the eyes have it um, on that. So what about, uh, are there signatures needed this week, I would presume? Yes. So um, how does the board want to handle signatures this week? Are you comfortable going in, Doug? Sure. We'll authorize Doug to sign the warrants. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Abstentions? And negatives? Okay, the ayes have it. Rosemary, are there any other action items or items you want to present? No, I don't have anything else. Doug, could I just say one more thing? Yes. Um, Rosemary, is there any chance you could get us the warrants of just a little bit sooner in the day? I feel like I'm really rushing to page through them. I'll try my best to do them earlier. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that. So when do I need to show up to sign those, uh, Rosemary? Within the next couple of days. Okay. All right. Um, so let's so uh, move on to the public work supervisor's report. All right. Uh, let me share this. Out for your screens. So uh, Jason, our acting public work supervisor uh, has given us a rundown of uh, kind of what they're working on for right now. Um, mostly it's getting ready for, it's kind of our fall into winter maintenance, uh, working on getting the, the trucks winterized, making sure that the, the plows and wings uh, and articulation is all working. Um, let's see, the closing up the gravel pit for the season, um, I think that we talked about this with Brian Krause before he left, uh, but for the time being, we do not have anybody uh, serving as the um, as the the MSHA safety coordinator. So that is it's closed down for the season, uh, but it's also closed until we have somebody trained uh, for that. But we wouldn't be opening it at the at this time anyway. Uh, so that's not a huge change. Doesn't Mark uh, you had a question? Uh, yeah, the the new man is uh, Mark. Is his name? Yes. Doesn't he have experience with that? 
I believe that Mark does have some experience with that. So we might, I'd have to double check with him, but I believe that was the case. Um, and so we might be able to reopen it if we needed to, but like I said, we close it for the winter regardless. Yep. Uh, so it's not really a big change Yep. for yep. us. Just, you know, when we had our, uh, our storm last year, we thought that we had closed the pit and then we needed to get some material out of it. So we reopened it temporarily. I believe that he did say he was MSHAW certified. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's correct, but I don't have his resume in front of me to, you know, be a hundred percent certain. Um, he should be starting next week, actually. So, or this, this week. week. This week, uh, Brian. Yeah, it's this week. He should be starting on, on Thursday or Friday. Um, yeah, so that is all going well. Um, and they don't really have any discussion items up uh, for winter maintenance. Uh, is there any questions about the kind of operation? Yes, Nat. Have we uh, submitted reimbursement to that company for uh, paint cleanup? I'm giving Jason a hand with the reporting on that. Uh, he's got all the data, he tracked everything well, uh, but the he's having a little bit of trouble with Excel and the computer reporting system. So we've got everything tracked, we're in communication with them, um, and I'm helping put together the, the final submission form. Thank you. About how many hours did that end up being, Brian? It was three or four hours between two people. Okay. But uh, three or four hours total, so about a, a, a little bit less than two hours for each person. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Not as bad as I thought. No, I thought it was going to be <laughs> most of it. It wasn't too bad. Um, we were a little bit... Uh, we didn't take action maybe as quickly as we could because we were concerned about our potential liability uh, by getting involved, you know, that this was their accident. And if we get involved with it, what kind of exposure are we going to have? Are we going to, you know, could we, we be held responsible for paint that ends up in the river because we participated in this, because we got, you know, so we were a little bit concerned about that. We got it sorted and then deployed to help. Um, but yeah, it was uh, not as much time as it maybe could have been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to provide a quick update about the job search and how that's going. Uh, Mike and I interviewed uh, candidates. We've got three candidates that we'd like to advance uh, that we were, we were pretty happy with. Um, the next step is I'm going to, uh, take each of them out to the garage, give them a little bit of a tour of the garage, meet the, the crew. And then hopefully uh, the plan is that our, our next meeting at our December meeting, uh, the select board will interview all the candidates that we had advanced past that round, which, you know, if they made it through this round, I, I expect they'll pass that round too. So are I'm these, expecting you'll interview three candidates. Are these three new candidates from the last? They are. All three of these candidates uh, have applied since we uh, interviewed previously. Mm -hmm. um, one of them applied very close to the original deadline, uh, but had just missed it. Uh, the others are more recent. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, since we're at a little early to go to your report as per the time schedule, let's uh, do items that weren't on that people weren't relying on our schedule for. So let's uh, why don't you do the update discussion on the social media policy? Okay. Uh, so the social media policy, I'm going to try and re finish that one up, but I wanted there was a point of discussion I wanted to raise. Uh, kind of an, an immediate concern is um, we have some concerning statements posted on 
the town Facebook page as replies to town sponsored posts. Um, and I would, I'd like if the select board would be kind of willing to endorse that we are only going to allow uh, factual statements on our um, on our posts, in particular, our posts about COVID nineteen. Can we go and see those comments? I expect so. Give me one moment. Um, it's um, it's pretty far out conspiracy stuff. Um, that's factually inaccurate and. Um, Really, for us to have it on our social media site that's visible for folks, I think, um, you know, I just I don't want to be a platform where people can um, share that kind of misinformation. So I don't know. Is, the other thing I was wondering is: is it possible to disable comments on Facebook? We can disable comments on Facebook if we feel that's necessary. It, are we talking about the November 10th post? I believe so. I'm sorry, my computer's a little bit slow, so I, I'm still trying to. Uh, I thought we just got new computers for everybody. Uh, not me. I had to get a computer outside of the. When I took over for Duncan, the computer wasn't due to be replaced, but okay. it. Um, it's okay. It's a different topic. Yeah. You just tend to be a smart aleck. Uh, okay, I've got this. Yes, the, the 10th, November 10th. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, reporting accurate factual information. We want to, we're not, we're hopefully not anybody's primary source for information about, you know, the pandemic, but I still am reluctant to allow, um, you know, misinformation through our, our communication channels. Well, I see what you're saying. It just seems like, I mean, it'd be one thing if, if that was in the post, but it's in a comment that people nope. can, it's not like you're endorsing the the comment, um, and and that's why it's worthy of discussion and not something that we would just or that I would just automatically take down. Um, you know that that I think it warrants board discussion. The advice I have had about uh, social media accounts like this, it was mostly about you know abusive or or slanderous comments, uh, but I think the same standard applies is uh, to have a consistent policy adopted. So this would be a an opportunity for for that if the board is interested. Um, so my quick take is I'd prefer just to disable comments um, so that we don't have to moderate it at all. We're not stuck in this position of does this pass muster or not? Is this actually true or not? And I also feel like we're in a position where somebody could go in and write something untrue about a local business or just kind of distasteful. Um, and there's plenty of places on the internet to do those sorts of things. And I don't think we need to be that platform. I understand that's uh, that's just one view, and uh, I don't know if that's right or not, but that's my current thinking. So I'm right. looking at Morseville's Facebook page. They allow comments. Um, I'm just seeing what other towns are doing. My only concern is that we're already we're already disabling the chat on our Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm just worried if we start shutting down every avenue for folks to, to comment, 
whether it's good or bad. Um, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm... Most towns that I'm aware of uh, have their comments available. Yeah. Um, and perform some level of moderation. Yeah. Um, that's one of the downsides of, of actively using Facebook as one of our tools for information is that it it takes more management time uh, to to use our Facebook account and keep it in good order. You know, it's not a as much of a one way street like Front Porch Forum is. And that, that's good and bad. I mean, th there's been a number of times where, uh, you know, within comments, uh, people have been able to answer their own, one resident has been able to answer questions from another resident. You know, th that there's been good civil discussions in our comments before, but. It really looks like, well, let's see, what's October 30th look like? There's a lot of comments there. I mean, it looks like that was the real, doozy one. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to a prior instance where um, someone made a comment on Facebook, I'll be kind of general about it, that was about a local business that Eric in, you know, being a moderator on the site felt wasn't positive, a positive reflection of the community. And so he took it down. Um, and that I, you know, I gave him heck about that. I was like, that's inappropriate here, <laughs> don't do that. Um, and it just puts us in this position where like, is this appropriate? Is it not appropriate? Is it, are there, are there gray areas in the policy? Is it something that we have to, that's, that's the only other prior instance that I thought we had a, an issue. Um, but when we start taking posts down that shouldn't be there for whatever reason, it's, um, it's just tricky, I think. We have an That's obligation. The only example that I'm really aware of uh, is the same one that Nat referred to. And yeah, uh, th that's kind of why we're having the discussion tonight and we wanna have a policy about it is, yes, we're talking about a particular instance, but it's more about how do we, are we, if we're willing to, we have to be willing to do this even-handedly and universally, whatever declaration or, or, or determination we make tonight has to be uh, applicable to more than just the particular case in front of us. Do we have an obligation to have a have a ability to comment? No, I don't think so. Okay. Do we? Is there a benefit, a significant benefit? To, to the community or to the select board for the comment sections? I think there is. I don't know if it would rise to the level of significant, but there is a measurable benefit uh, for allowing individuals to communicate. Um, it happens a lot with rec posts that people talk and kind of answer each other's questions uh, about recreation kind of on the spot. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about all the other groups. That's true. I'm, I'm very hesitant about regulating it that heavy handedly. Um, uh, I'd like to hear actually what the, what the public thinks here. Um, but uh, it feels like more times than not either, like you said, Brian, it, it gets self-regulated by other people, you know, responding. And I feel like unless it gets really hate filled, <laughs> you know, um, that you can just, just ignore it. Just don't even, I mean, if anybody takes a comment within your post as, as, as truth, then they, that, that's very silly. Um, that's clearly one individual's opinion, not not the opinion of the town. I, I just I'm, I'm just hesitant to 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 keep shutting down air, 
you know, re um, venues of, of, of public comment and expression. I think that gets, I, f I already feel like we're doing it too much, <laughs> um, even here on Zoom. So I, I would love to hear what other people think, but I, I think we should keep it open. Okay. Uh, so Scott, I think you had your hand up first and then I'll get to uh, Rick and the others. So, yeah, Scott? thanks for um, letting me speak. So instead of um, disabling the comment, just have a, you know, a strong um, baseline comment or um, model. And if it's a threat to public health and safety due to misinformation, um, and in this case, directly related to a pandemic, it should just be removed. Um, you're giving somebody a platform to spread misinformation on, on a town owned platform, that's concerning. Um, so if it's a threat to public health and safety, uh, due to misinformation, you know, I, I think everybody has to be responsible on this one and just remove it. I, I'd leave the comments open, but when it crosses that line, um, and that may have to be determined by the select board every time it happens or give Brian the authority <clears throat> to, um, to remove it. It's um, sad that we're having that on our Facebook page. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. And up next, I've got Rick. Go ahead and unmute, Rick. Hi, thanks for uh, recognizing me. Um, I've been on two meetings that have been Zoom bombed recently, one on September 11th and one on November 11th. Uh, and uh, the chat was not disabled before on any of those meetings. Um, it does make running a meeting difficult because uh, the meeting I was on on uh, November 11th, I was, uh, everybody was put in the waiting room and then several people were not able to get back into the meeting. And that was unfortunate. Um, I would also like to say, uh, let me see here, let me, I, I need to check my notes. Okay, so um, League of Cities and Towns uh, has open meeting resources available. And um, I think it would be wise for the committee, possibly the, or the select board, I mean, to, to review the League of Cities and Towns recommendations regarding the open meeting law. Um, I personally think that you do get on a slippery slope when you disable the chat. Um, it opens the door for further uh, checks maybe on uh, public participation. And as one who uh, enjoys uh, being able to speak to the boards, I would like to try to keep the meetings as open and as transparent as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Is there, any, is there anyone else? I, if we can, I'd like to close off this discussion as it seems clear to me, you know, but take any other comments. But uh, I know that we have Rob Moore waiting uh, for our uh, road erosion inventory presentation. Uh, I've got two more comments and then we'll, we'll get in with Rob. Okay, Athena, I've got you up next. Hey, this is actually Shane. Um, okay. I think the idea of to get a social media policy is a really, really smart one, especially given that particular situation. Um, I would definitely suggest consulting with the attorney. Uh, there have been some court cases saying that politicians and elected officials can't block people on Twitter. So I would just be concerned that the same of thing of uh, denying, you know, someone who lives in the town the ability to communicate with their government in that way um, might run into some First Amendment issues. So just keep that in mind. Thank you, Shane. And Beth. 
can you hear me okay yes i see myself lit up um i was just going to say i echo um both scott and rick and also i think that there needs to be some verbiage on a policy around harassment because when i read some of the posts that are being referred to i would consider some of those responses harassment someone asked a question and the response to the question was a um unfactual link to a website with you know all the things that go against public health but the person asked in response to that not to get further comment she wanted a legitimate question question answered and there was a second post and there were follow-up posts so i mean i consider that harassment and i think that's a really important piece of having a policy established for any social media site um and yeah so that's my comment and i i strongly um I strongly am in favor of keeping comments um, because I often don't see, I'll go, I look at Facebook daily, but I sometimes don't see posts from our town for a couple of days and I'll miss things like public um, notices that I actually want to see because I want to be able to join some of the things that I just don't see soon enough. And if somebody can tag my name in those comments, I really appreciate that because it means I see it quickly. Um, so that's just another method of communication that definitely is used by me and my connections quite often. So thanks. Thank you, Beth. That's actually a, sorry to, to derail us a little bit further down this, but uh, I, when talking about a, a substantial benefit, I think the comments can be a substantial benefit in particular, the recent paint striping issues. There were a number of people who got the contact information by being tagged in the comments on Facebook and not just Johnson residents. Uh, so I, I can, I said, I wasn't sure if we could point to it as being a substantial material benefit, but that, that was a case where it, it was. Um, so we'll, we'll go down this track a little bit further. Uh, but this wasn't on our schedule. And as I understand uh, Doug's request with, with the board's permission, we're gonna divert and uh, go review our road erosion inventory update for 2020. I might, unless there, uh, someone on the board has different ideas, I, I would presume that we ought to be coming back to this in another meeting, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, part of the thing is, uh, we need to go through our agendas, handle them and get it done too. That's all part of uh, our role. Yeah. Okay, so the next item is the road erosion, erosion inventory. You yeah. wanna set that up, Brian? Uh, yeah, Diana, we'll, we'll circle back to uh, the comments in a little bit, but I'll, I'll remember that you had a, a question to ask. Uh, so the road erosion inventory is part of what we are required to have for the um, municipal road general permit. What it means is that we will go around to every hydrologically connected road segment and get kind of a status report of what's happening at that location. Um, this was the reason our board packet was quite so uh, long this week it is that the it was data for the road erosion inventory. Um, I'm going to put up on the screen right now the summary page and then uh, at the same time We've got Rob Moore from LCPC here, who has done uh, a lot of the administrative work and supports our road projects uh, with the state in general. Okay. I wanted uh, to ask a, a question. To that, I want to ask the question, if I might, is this, uh, do we have to officially announce that this is part of the public hearing or just part of the select board meeting is sufficient? Uh, it's just sufficient that this is part of our regular meeting. It doesn't need its own, you know, public hearing uh, designation. 
Okay, it can be you. part of our regular meeting. Thank you. All right, so um, right now we've got between the, the, the pie graph on the left is our big one uh, that right now the majority of our road segments either aren't connected. So the, the, it doesn't matter if what's happening there when, and when it comes to erosion or fully meet. So we're in relatively, we're in pretty good shape. That leaves us with 126 road segments uh, that need attention. Um, so that that's, you know, that that's relatively good shape. Um, getting into a little bit more detail, we've got information about the types of roads. You see that on our class four roads, um, We've got 185 segments that are on class four roads. Uh, most of our road segments uh, that are hyd hydrologically connected, most of our road segments are on our gravel roads and a relatively small number are, are on our paved roads. Um, uh, on the priority segments, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but blue means, what does blue mean? Blue in that pie chart means no priority. Okay. Uh, so we have a, a small number of high and very high uh, road segments. So that, that's pretty good news. Uh, it's very good news that we have only three road segments that are on the very high priority list. The purpose of the hearing mostly is, um, you know, to kind of explain the process, let people know what's going on. And, um, you know, if we get into this and you have questions about, you know, was my road covered? Was this spot covered? Uh, that this would be a good time to raise those questions because if it turns out there was anything we missed, uh, we can, we have an opportunity to catch that before the final report uh, is presented to the board. You know, right now we're still in the, the data section. Uh, all right, um, so Rob, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, please. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to keep this quick and, and um, uh, I appreciate the question from Doug at the beginning about a, a public hearing. Um, this isn't um, that sort of uh, um, project. Um, um, you all uh, probably remember um, well over a year ago, may, I think it may have been two years ago, um, we suggested that LCPC would apply for a grant from the Agency of Transportation to uh, receive funding to conduct your road erosion inventory, which is required by the Municipal Road General Permit. And the data that we are discussing tonight is a result of that work. Uh, the deadline for the municipal road general permit uh, to for the town to submit in quotes submit their data um, is this coming December 31st and uh, most of this data was actually collected in um, 2019 um, before the Halloween storm so that is an opportunity for me to emphasize that this uh, data and the final report that I will present to you, uh, I believe on December 7th or thereabouts, um, is a snapshot in time. Uh, conditions can and do change at a moment's notice or overnight as folks might say. And the Halloween storm is a great example of that. Now, I'll note that with the Halloween storm example, some might think that the changes I'm referring to that can and do happen are negative in terms of the municipal road general permit. If a section of road got wiped out by the storm and there is severe erosion, that would be a change to the negative that's not captured in this data. The flip side can also occur that the highway department is constantly out there doing good work, 
they uh, uh, com conduct work on their regular budget as well as using uh, grant funding and they make progress towards compliance with the municipal road general permit. And so any work that was done after this inventory was con conducted um, also would not be captured in this data set. So again, I'm gonna keep using that phrase snapshot in time. The value of this to the select board body is that it's a representation of the scale of magnitude of which your town uh, might typically be facing on any given day. Um, and and that, that really is the highest value. And as Brian was indicating, relative to other towns in Lamoille County that I work with, Johnson is in very good shape. And I credit that to the highway department and Brian's story and the leadership of the select board. Uh, you have uh, less, almost 29% of the road segments that are jurisdictional to the municipal road general permit, about 29% need work. And that's reflected in the 84 plus 42 that Brian mentioned. Um, the, that, I find that most towns are around 50% compliance when we conduct this snapshot. Uh, and some towns are, are as high as uh, 60 or, or even a little bit more than 60% not complying. Um, so again, Johnson is in really good shape. I do wanna take a quick second to uh, thank the select board uh, for the opportunity that you had given me to work with Brian uh, Krause uh, over the years that he was employed with the town. Brian was a true pleasure to work with and uh, a, a real gentleman and a, and a very nice person to work with. Anytime I needed anything uh, for my work in support of the town, Brian did everything he could to help me out and um, that was greatly appreciated. So kudos to, to Brian and Brian and the select board on, on uh, allowing me to work with Brian Krause. Um, so um, this data, another interesting thing to think about is the um, status uh, identifiers of does not meet, fully meets or partially meets uh, are calculated by an algorithm in the software that does not necessarily uh, account for whether erosion is actually present or not. Um, and I'll explain that. What we do when we go and assess the roads uh, segment by segment, which by the way are 100 meters or 328 feet, um, that's why uh, it, you have 923 total segments. Uh, that should add up roughly to the road mileage um, in your entire town. Um, these 100 meter segments are assessed for whether they comply with the required best management practices in place. And the software algorithms do not necessarily account for whether erosion is actually present. So there are cases, uh, very few, but they can exist, where uh, erosion is not present, yet that segment fails to meet the standards and is indicated in the red, uh, does not meet, or orange, yellow, partially meets. The flip side of that can also happen, uh, very unusual again, but it can happen in situations where um, all of the best management practices required by the municipal road general permit are in place, yet there is still erosion. So um, this is the tool that we have to use. And so uh, thinking about that um, is where I uh, bring your attention to, the, to the, what I mentioned a minute ago about this being a good reference for the scale of magnitude of uh, work 
um, that the town is required to do before the year 2036, when the uh, permit um, uh, requires all towns to comply fully with the law. Um, are there any questions so far? It uh, looks like we do have one from the audience. Okay, go ahead, Kim. Uh, you'll have to unmute. There you go. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, this is all about roads. How do things like parking lots fit into this picture of um, my understanding is trying to improve water quality in the end. And when we see a huge amount, um, two things, parking lots and also paved roads, which you would think wouldn't be an issue, but the yellow line paint was a great example of showing us exactly what's going on with the amount of water um, that's taking stuff off the road and directly into the stream. And I don't yeah, know, Rob, if you need a reference for that about what happened on the yellow paint thing, but it was just a big rainstorm after they applied yellow paint and you could just see everything going right into the stream. Yep. Yeah, I am aware of that. Yeah. Thank you. And good and, and good question. Um, this regulation is um, a, an out one of many outcomes uh that were set in motion when the state legislature uh created the uh i believe it's called act 64 the the vermont clean water lake or or um, um some folks refer to it as the, the lake champlain clean water act um and this particular tool that the state put in motion is specifically about municipal roads so it does not include municipal owned parking lots. This assessment does also not include state roads or state parking lots. Uh, the state has their own version of the road permit called the TS4. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't recite what TS4 stands for, but it is the uh, VTRANS version of the road permit to which they are required to comply on a similar timeline. Um, and so what this work does cover uh, uh, of, of the content in the question is paved roads. And it covers uh, municipal paved roads that uh, have catch basins. And it also covers municipal paved roads that are so-called open ditches. Um, I am happy to uh, discuss the details with um, uh, the select board and, and, and Brian um, at your desire, uh, where we could take some time offline that we don't have to take up time in your meeting to discuss some nuances around that. Um, but there is a reflection of, of why I'm bringing that up in regards to the part of the data set related to catch basin outlets. And um, uh, as with any data set that begins on a, uh, a, a high altitude sort of uh, view, um, uh, there's inevitably um, some built-in errors that will occur that need to be corrected by field verification. And um, so there is over a dozen, maybe even close to two dozen um, catch basins, the state had assigned an assumption that these catch basins were owned and controlled by the town of Johnson. Uh, when my colleagues uh, worked with Brian Krause to dig into that part of the data set, what they discovered is actually many of these catch basins are not actually owned or operated or controlled by the town, uh, but rather many of them are associated with the state road. And so they are state owned, so to speak. And there may be at least one, uh, perhaps more than one that are uh, privately owned. Um, and so 
uh, that sort of component of the data is something that I will want to go through uh, with Brian's story um, to a certain degree with a fine tooth comb to ensure that the feedback that we provide to the state uh, reflects the town's uh, understanding. Um, and so I would propose that I work with uh, Brian on on that, uh, evaluating the data as it's been collected and presented to you with the select board packet. We'll dig into that. I will create a draft, a draft final report, if you can follow me on that. And the uh, draft final report would then pre be presented to the select board on December 7th. And at that time, I would ask you to uh, accept the work that I have done pending any further modifications to the data set that Brian Story would direct me to do between December 7th and December 31st, uh, December 31, uh, when that um, data set is due to the state. There's also a little bit of paperwork that again, I will work with Brian Story on making sure that that's submitted to the proper folks at the state uh, to verify that the town has indeed accepted uh, the data that they uh, actually already have in their hands. Um, so the state has a copy of this data on their, uh, in, in, in their hands, so to speak, electronically, um, but they have stamped it with a label that says unofficial data, something along the lines of this is unofficial data until the town formally approves it. And so your deadline to, for formal approval is December 31st, which is why I have my eye on December 7th to meet with the select board one more time on this subject. Um, and the last piece I wanted to mention, um, while uh, you might be formulating a couple questions for me is, uh, the last time I met uh, with this group on Zoom, um, I was asked to produce a list of class four roads and the status of those roads in terms of LCPC's ability to assess and collect data that would be contained in this report. So I did, uh, I did provide that and um, uh, to the to the planning commission and Brian Story, um, I apologize I didn't sum up the grand total, but it appears that it is uh, well over thirty segments, perhaps over forty segments, which were not accessible by LCPC staff and therefore not assessed and therefore not contained in this data set. If they were not assessed, they are omitted by the algorithms and the software that drive this uh, interface of the pie charts that you're looking at. Uh, Rob, this is Doug Moldy. I have a question. If someone wanted to look at a particular area that was of concern to them, how would they match that to the segment ID? That's a great question, Doug. And I apologize, the interface is not really um, friendly for the non-technical folks, but the chart that Brian just pulled up in the very first column on the far left is called segment ID. That number, which can be anywhere from four to six, maybe even more digits long, that's the code that is used to find the location of that segment in the town um, primarily using the Agency of Natural Resource Atlas or the Natural Resource Atlas or the Municipal Road General Permit web portal that uses a GIS uh, based platform to show the, the mapping related to this. I did provide a map, but the scale of that map being at the town uh, showing the entire town, you have to look very closely to try to discern the 100 meter segments. Uh, one value to that map is at a glance, you can visually see 
uh, what what Brian was portraying with the pie charts is that a vast majority of your road segments actually meet the MRGP and or are not subject to the jurisdiction of the MRGP. Um, we, and we get so, some instructions on how to uh, access the information so a person can use this? I would be happy to go over that with you, Doug, or anyone who wants a little tutorial. I'm not an IT expert, and so I would I, I, it, would, it would not be right of me to say that I could write up a, 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 an easy to follow summary on how to do that. Um, and I apologize that that tool just simply is not available at this time. Um, I, I, I would be willing to go over it with um, Brian's story um, so that then um, uh, Brian could, could use that mapping tool, that web mapping tool to zoom in on any particular segment he wants to. Um, and Doug, I'm happy to communicate directly with you or anyone else on the select board uh, to dig into specific questions about specific locations. Um, the, the section of the chart that Brian has up now, um, You'll see that towards the right, uh, all the way on the right, there's a status and that's a general status of the entire 100 meters. In the immediate preceding columns, uh, they may have a, a, a P for partially meets, an F for fully meets, a D for does not meet, or an N for not applicable. And so um, there is, again, an algorithm that uh, looks at each of these parameters that are, that are the required best management practices and it uh, weighs them um, uh, in some sort of formula to come up with the overall score. Um, sometimes you can have one P and everything else is uh, one, one partially meets and everything else fully meets and it's a partially meets and um, other times uh, you can have two Ps and that would, uh, could, depending on where those partially meets are, um, could automatically make that segment uh, as a does not meet um, uh, the road permit at all. Um, and and the, 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 the good news is the general trend in Johnson seems to indicate to me that um, most of the uh, most of the partial and, and does not meet um, identifiers are assigned to either the crown of the road of the gravel road or what they call a shoulder berm or windrow on the side of the road. Um, there are a few that apply to where a ditch turns and meets and conveys the ditch water into a lake, river, stream, wetland, et cetera. And they call that a conveyance zone um, where the ditch conveys it into the waterway itself. That item in particular is quite rigid in, um, in that um, it must have these certain parameters or else it kicks the entire segment into a does not meet status. The priorities uh, that were shown on the original PRI chart are, are again uh, determined by an algorithm by the software that um, uh, uh, in addition to not accounting for, for whether erosion is present or not, it, it certainly does not account for the priorities of the um, town. It's simply an algorithm by the computer to determine if all things are equal uh, regarding erosion um, what might the priority be? Generally, that means the steeper the road and the more erosion there is on that steeper road, uh, the higher priority, uh, um, it, they give it a higher priority. So, Are you Ron, I've got a question, as long as we're talking about slope, uh, is that just a scale or does that refer to, can we translate that to a hard number? 
you know, uh, the slope, slope column, the Brian. Line. Yeah, that that is that that represents a percentage of uh, right. of, of slope. So a two percent slope is the top line on Basin Road uh, that you're showing. Um, so that segment of Basin Road is fairly flat. Um, and these are whole numbers that were determined in the field by LCPC staff upon inspection. There are also uh, automatically generated slopes um, provided by the state uh, agency of natural resources. And um, most of the time the um, calculated slope is correct. Um, but once in a while it's not correct because they're, they're coming up with those measurements uh, based on um, satellite technology trying to read the terrain. So you can imagine there might be instances where the satellite technology misreads what's happening underneath a tree canopy. Um, and, and, and so we, LCPC staff rounds to the uh, nearest whole number. Um, the fact whether it was a 2.3 or 2.6% slope is irrelevant in terms of the municipal road general permit. Great. That's why they're all round numbers. Thank you. So looking at like Basin Road where you have not connected, there's no indication of crown, berm, drainage, et cetera. So if it's not connected, you didn't, uh, th those things are irrelevant? Th that's a good eye, Doug. Um, uh, the, the LCPC staff that was collecting the data, um, um, they, they improved their process as they proceeded. And um, there are times when they determined that a segment was not connected and they collected data on each of the components anyway. And there were other times that they determined a segment was not collected and they just stopped and they didn't collect any data at that point and they moved on to the next segment. It's also worth noting if I can add here, uh, on a class four road, the requirements are different uh, for meeting and not meeting the standards. Correct, thank you, Brian. The, uh, the, the gist of it is um, no action is required on a class four road unless, uh, according to the municipal road general permit, unless the uh, observed erosion is uh, 12 inches or deeper. It does not account for the width of the erosion scour. It only looks at the depth. And then once you say yes, that, that erosion scour is more than 12 inches deep, at that point, the LCPC staff actually measures the uh, gully and collects data on the width and depth and length of that gully. Uh, to approximate the volume of soil that has been transported somewhere downhill. The requirement from the permit then is to fix that spot of erosion um, with whatever the appropriate tool may be uh, or technique, best management practice. Um, so if that means you put a water bar in the class four road and that will stop the erosion, um, that meets the permit. Um, in more complex situations, it may be that the town decides they need to install a culvert on a class four road and that will address the erosion. So you have many tools in your toolbox on how to address the erosion on class four roads. Class two, well, class one, two, three, and, uh, and three roads um, they're much more prescriptive in terms of the various columns of crown, shoulder berm, drainage, conveyance, et cetera. Um, and each one of those is evaluated individually, um, whether erosion, um, whether they meet the, 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 uh, the standards, uh, the prescribed standards or not. And the gully approach that I described, the gully evaluation for class four roads, um, conveniently for us and our sake, for our sake of understanding it, also applies to catch basin outlets. So a catch basin outlet where it discharges to the river would fully meet the road permit 
if there is uh, if there is no erosion of 12 inches or deeper uh, at the outlet. If there is erosion of 12 inches or deeper at the outlet, then all of the um, uh, related road segments that direct water towards that catch basin outlet um, automatically do not pass. Okay. Looks like we've got a couple public questions. Uh, Scott, I think you had your hand up first and then I've got Rick and Diana. Yeah, my concerns are on Clay Hill, directly in front of our house. And I'll take, um, I'll make my comments offline, not to burn up people's time. But basically, Clay Hill has no crown in front of our house, and it ends up in our house um, every time it rains. But I'll true that up with you guys later. OK. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, OK, Rick, uh, go ahead. Hi. Um, I, I'd like to also echo Scott's sentiment, uh, sentiments. I live at 43 Railroad Street and um, have a perennial puddle in front of my house. And I'm wondering to kind of follow up on what Kim said was uh, she mentioned something about parking lots and runoff. And I'd like to uh, say that there have been like three major building projects that uh, have no um, uh, stormwater runoff uh, restrictions and they've made the flooding in the road even worse and the discharge goes to the river. So um, I guess maybe asking a kind of a general question, uh, where, where can we go from here uh, in terms of trying to uh, mitigate uh, in some way, shape or form, uh, some of the problems that Scott attested to? Well, uh, like with Scott's question, the, the those are going to be discussions about kind of where do we go next and what our priority projects will be going forward. Um, in front of us right now uh, is we're collecting the information about where those locations are. So uh, Rick, and this goes for anybody else, uh, we can uh, make sure that your road segment is covered in this. Um, you know, I, I don't really want to take the time in the middle of the meeting for that, but but Rick will make sure, and Scott will make sure that both of those items are inventoried in here uh, and are recognized as uh, part of the priority for uh, future projects. How many more comments do we have, uh, Brian? I've got one more. Okay, then, then uh, I think we should move on uh, because we can return to this on the 7th. Yes. And one thing I would like to say is that I think that we should, uh, you consulting with Rob should should put together something that maybe can go on our webpage so people can find out directed to specific sections. Right, we'll see if we can put together kind of an explainer about how to look at it. I know on the a and r Atlas, it's not hard to uh, find out what the ID is for a particular road. I'm not sure, given an ID, I'm not sure how to find the road, but when you've got the road, it's not too hard to find the ID. Yeah, with, without information, this, this, this is just data for our people. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go on to the next comment. Okay, Diana, you had a, a question or comment? Yeah, um, just, a, just a quickie. I wanted to know about the 12 inch erosion standard and that would not meet the permit requirements. Is that the permit that would be enforced starting in 2036 or is that some standard that would be enforceable before that? And if you have 12 inches of erosion, it seems like that's the kind of thing that the adjacent homeowner would need to address like right away so like if they fix the problem and it's no longer measurable at 12 inches, but obviously it was before they fixed it, how does that get documented anyway? So I get the, the, this inventory is gonna be a snapshot in time. It's not, uh, it may or may not capture uh, 
incidents. And like you said, 12 inches of, of, of erosion is pretty bad. You know, that ideally we wouldn't, in most cases, we would have addressed that problem before it got to that, that level. Uh, we did have some instances, I know, uh, I know Basin Road was one of the areas that was covered that uh, we did some work on Basin Road after the storm event last year uh, because it exceeded that standard uh, and it kind of exceeded it all at once. Uh, but usually we, you know, ideally would be, would catch uh, erosion problems before it reached that level, uh, you know, that we'd be interested in, uh, you know, hopefully they're going to show up in our own work and our own road assessments uh, sooner than that. But this is, is kind of a fallback. The ultimate responsibility for this does not take place until 2036. Uh, but between now and then, uh, annually we're certifying to the state through things like this road erosion inventory, what our work is on our way to 100% compliance. So it's, there isn't exactly, the consequences aren't exactly going to happen. Uh, you know, we're not going to, to receive any kind of sanction or anything between now and then, uh, provided we're, you know, still making progress and still working on it. Um, but yeah, it ultimately comes due that we have to reach that 100% by then. But uh, yeah, between now and then, it's that we have to demonstrate progress. And we demonstrate progress through things like this, that we've done the inventory, we can show, uh, you know, how we're assessing and deciding on priority projects uh, based on, you know, their, their impact. Okay, let's, uh, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you, everyone. I'm going to drop you, off now. I uh, appreciate you. your time very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night, Rob. Thank, thank you. you. So now we have, uh, is Scott Grizzled here on the, um, the ANEMS uh, budget? Scott, I don't see you on here. <laughs> All right, so I did receive the updated NIMS budget. I'm going to share that with you right now. I should say I received the uh, town share of the updated NIMS budget. Can you enlarge that? <laughs> yeah. Some reason I can't. I don't know why that's grayed out. Uh, that's better. Okay. Nope. Oh. All right. We're set on this now. Yep. You can read it okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry for that. Uh, but yeah, uh, so the um, our share is going up. Uh, there is an increase that all towns are experiencing. Um, you know, it is not the, the increase is not as large as it was in uh, last year, but it is an increase. Um, you know, we're going from uh, 41.1 cents, or we're going to 41.1 cents up from 39.87, uh, giving us a total of $141,507, which gives us an increase of $20,000. Uh, 3%. Brian, are these calendar years? 
I have to review our contract, but I believe that it is a calendar year. All right, so it'll take a little deciphering to figure out the budget, direct budget impact for March, for, for, for next fiscal year. Didn't we have a bump last year that was based on catching up to switching fiscal years? I think you may be right, Doug. I could be. Uh, I Doug is have, Doug is right. I may have misspoke because I think that we were switching to fiscal year, so it should no longer be calendar year. So if that be the case, it's actually more than three percent. that's the case, how come they presented the data this way? Yeah, why did they? Was Scott supposed to be here to explain stuff or? Uh, we had invited him. Okay. Uh, would you like me to, uh, so kind of all we can do right now is, is receive the information um, you know that this is their budget request but without Scott we can't really ask a lot of questions um, and uh, if you'd like I can request his presence at our, our next meeting please do yeah. move on to the next agenda item I think it's uh, important that he's here you have a question from the public uh, if we're willing yeah. go ahead okay all right Diana as an EMS provider in the town of Morristown, I just would like to um, suggest that it might be worth the select board's time to do a similar type of an analysis through a committee to the one that we're down doing with the law enforcement to do with EMS services. Um, and obviously I don't think I'd be the best match for that one because it'd be a distinct conflict of interest, but um, I think that it would really benefit the town to take a closer look at what you're getting for what you're paying and um, how well the services are being provided at the moment and, you know, worth taking a deeper look. It's a good idea. Usually those who bring those ideas up should be on that committee. Um, I, I think I, my, my... I know, I'm just kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I can speak from my experience of, you know, we always cover for each other. And when one town's going through a shortage of, of personnel, you know, the neighboring town kicks in. And we had a hard time in Morristown. And, you know, NEMS covered for us quite a bit. And right now, it's kind of the reverse, you know, and I know as a provider in, in Johnson, I've been at the end of my 12 hour or 24 hour shift. And I've had to go to North Hyde Park to cover for NIMS. I've had to go to the to Johnson right across from the NIMS station to cover for NIMS. And I'm not complaining that I have to do that because it's what we do for each other. But I think it's worth the towns knowing that that's happening. That, you know, when somebody literally right in on the street in a car accident in front of NIMS has to wait 30 minutes for me to come from Morrisville, you know, people need to know that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And when I go at the end of a 12 hour shift to North Hyde Park and have to take a critical patient to Burlington mm -hmm. and my shift turns into a 15 hour shift, you know, that's not really great for anybody. Mm -hmm. I think and I think that, you know, this isn't so much a complaint as it is uh, encouragement that the public be aware of the situation and, and have a say in a decision in this, that situation the way that they want it to be. I think that these are questions that could be put to Scott. Uh, my recollection from having attended the meeting last year is, is their, their cost per capita were substantially under Morrisville's. Uh, the, I, I don't know, I, I think that Scott needs to, uh, you know, we were covering for Cambridge, we covered for Morrisville. Uh, if they're covering for us disproportionately, we need to somehow affect that. Uh, and we ought to be asking him questions about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Diana, for your insight. 
Yes, thank you. Yeah. Please come back next week, Di next <laughs> next month, Diana. Yeah, please. Uh, or the next meeting, whenever that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I think that we can't take this any further right now. Yeah, we, we've received it and we'll have to, we've got some questions. So the, we'll have to cover those uh, in the future with, uh, with Scott. So item four, health care cost increases. Yep. Skip so, number three. Oh, oh, uh, yes, we did skip over that. Oh, uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. So the Racial Justice Committee and Law Enforcement Study Committee I have both both requested uh, for professional minute takers to assist uh, their their boards. Um, you know, it is difficult for board members to both participate in the uh, kind of proceedings of the committee and take minutes at the same time. And uh, uh, they didn't have any particular volunteers to to take that on. Um, so they're, they're requesting funds to pay somebody like Donna or somebody Donna recommends. Uh, and then we also had a, uh, a volunteer who would for paid minutes. Uh, when it comes to the, oh, uh, sorry, I think Scott, I'm gonna, can I back us up to the previous one? Uh, I think okay. Scott may be here. Uh, he might be our caller. Uh, Scott, if you dial star six, you should be unmuted. Yeah, I can. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. I apologize, Scott. I, I didn't notice the phone number dialing in. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, and I do have an answer to that question, and that's a very positive answer in our regards. But as Brian said, we're asking for roughly a 3% increase this year um, for all ambulance services. It's been a, and that is an answer to your question. That is for your fiscal year. Thank you. Um, we work off from calendar year, but we made a change last year. So what we asked from the towns was for your fiscal years, not our calendar year. Um, so as Brian said, we're asking for a $4,235 increase. It's been a difficult year. Um, basically, there were virtually no calls for two months. As of October 22nd, um, we had a loss of $104,906. Um, in our regular operating budget. Um, we have received monies for COVID testing, um, $41,679. We just learned that our PPP loan um, has become a grant, so we're not gonna have to pay that back, fortunately. And we have received two COVID relief grants from the state of Vermont. Um, those grants, and the COVID testing amount to $226,792. So right now that leaves us um, with $121,886 to the good. Why are we asking for a slight increase? Well, we expect another shutdown, um, I think we all are expecting another shutdown. Our payroll is in Johnson is $70,000 a month. So that extra $120,000 can be eaten up quite quickly. And I was asked at another meeting why we didn't level fund. Um, my experience is level, fund, level funding always comes back to haunt you, which means in the next year or two, you're going to have to ask for a larger increase than what you hope to because you level funded one year. So any questions? Oh, the other thing we did receive was $22,800 from the state for hazard pay to our employees. 
100% of that money goes to the employees, any employee that makes less than $25 an hour. Um, so there is n absolutely no funds left from that. And actually we lose money on that because the employer has to pay the portions for workman's comp, social security, Medicare, and retirement plans. So it sounds good when you're given the money, but everything always costs you a little bit as you probably know. Any questions as far as that, as far as the um, mutual aid calls, I will respond to that after I answer any other questions. Can you put the budget back up, or those numbers back up, Brian, please? Yeah, sure. Okay, there it is. So when you say 2021 cost, you're talking about the fiscal year starting in July 1st, July 1st, 2021. Yes. Thanks. Appreciate it. Any questions on the funding? And again, at the end of the year, we'll get you our final budget um, and our report as well. Uh, Scott, hi, this is Kyle Noose. Um, so you're saying that the increase is a projection that you're projecting that there's gonna be a shutdown and a loss of revenue versus you need this extra money for something well, the, like equipment or, or whatever. Well, the, um, that extra money is for, let's say there was no COVID. That extra money is for um, increase in costs and salaries, increase in costs and fuel, um, increase in costs and insurances, et cetera. So that's our normal budget. We are looking at this money from the COVID grants and COVID testing to get us through this fiscal year. Does that make sense? Because we don't expect right now, as I said, October 1st, we'd lost $105,000. From those grants, we have 120, just under $122,000 less. Mm -hmm. I suspect in the next couple of months, we'll eat up a major portion of that. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you don't, first, if we don't, we'll have to address that at the end of next year. Um, there's different ways of we could use extra money, and we would talk to the select boards about potentially lowering your budget, but again, that can come back to haunt you in the long run. We could use that money um, in our building capital expense and our ambulance replacement capital expense accounts, so we would not have to have those increases um, for future years. Yeah, just because, as you can imagine, like this, the, the increased trend is, is concerning for for us, you know. Um. Right, but 3% is basically the cost of living. And again, we have no clue um, whether we will have any of that grant funding left over the next several months because call volume is definitely down. And what, 17% of our year, two months, just under 17% of our year, we were pretty much shut down for transports. Um, 911 calls were way down because nobody was driving. Nobody on the roads, um, surgeries, there, weren't, um, there were no surgeries going on. It was very, very difficult. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Are there any other uh, questions on this? 
Scott, did you want to address the mutual aid question? Yes, um, the state of Vermont, you, um, we can get statistics from the state of Vermont and we do periodically about your number of your calls, official number of calls so that information's not coming from us. I received some of those thus far this year. Um, we have assisted on, where did it go? 56 mutual aid calls to surrounding communities. We have received mutual aid 44 times. And as we've discussed previously, mutual aid is something all services depend on. We can't be everything to everybody. We can't staff um, as well as we would all like. I mean, we have two, two crews for a 12 hour shift and one crew for a, um, the other 12 hour shift. And we have no idea when calls are coming in. Um, and thus, I mean, nobody could afford if we went to three crews or two crews for both things, we would have to have huge increases in the budget. So we're doing the best with what we've got. Um, we give mutual aid and we receive mutual aid. It's the, um, it's part of it. And I don't think there is an issue with us having more than we've had in the past. Yeah. Uh, and again, we've given more than we have received. Scott, is it possible, just thinking about, you know, if we're hearing from, well, let me start over. Is it possible that the mutual aid that we're receiving is just coming disproportionate from one surrounding town um, and not going necessarily back to that town, but going to other towns? You know what well, they... <clears throat> The mutual aid system is set up based upon, <clears throat> upon the location of the call to the neighboring services. Our neighboring services, of course, Morristown and Cambridge. And so depending upon where that mutual aid call, the address is, is who gets the call from the sheriff's department uh, to go to that call. I think Morristown receives mutual aid from both us and Stowe. Um, Cambridge receives mutual aid from us and Fairfax. So it's set up into the computer system who is called uh, as far as their proximity to the call location. Okay, but I'm just saying if there was a, and I don't know exactly what's going on, but if there was an impression that Morrisville's giving an, an unusual amount of uh, um, uh, calls, uh, mutual aid calls to Johnson or Hyde Park and, and not getting them. It could be because they're covering for these towns more, whereas the, the mutual aid you're providing for other towns is more towards Cambridge, just based on where the calls are coming from. Um, I can get that information, but I can tell you that um, a bulk of our mutual aid calls, a vast bulk, bulk still goes into the Morristown area. But I will get that information. But you're um, not feeling you're not feeling that th like you're understaffed or you're staffed less now than you have been in the past. No, we certainly are not. Um, we've not had an issue with the number of employees this year. We've had we've been there every time again it's always been two crews for the 12 hour day shift and one crew for the 12 hour evening shift um when and where those calls come in we have no control over and again for patient service the closest service to the call is the one that is requested mm -hmm. so for portions of morseville we go for other portions of morseville still goes um, for portions of our territory, Cambridge is called. For other portions, more sound is called. It's for to for the quickest um, reaction um, to get to the site of the call. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on this subject? We uh, go back to the racial justice committee and uh, law enforcement request for minute takers. Thanks for being here, Scott. Appreciate you calling in. No problem. You guys have a good evening.
Thank you. We're, we're sorry. We apologize for missing you. Oh, no problem. I just figured that sooner or later that somebody would realize I was there. Yep. Thanks again, Thanks. Scott. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. So that pretty well takes us up. If you recall uh, where we were at with the uh, discussion was that, yeah, each of these two committees has requested uh, funds for um, for hiring a uh, minute taker. Uh, if we, the, the only real difference between the two with the law enforcement study committee, uh, we, that's an intermunicipal group. So presumably we would only be pay, paying a share of the minute taker for that group rather than the entire thing. We can also, uh, the racial justice committee is a town and village. Uh, so we can request uh, village support for that too, if we so desire. Uh, I see Rick Opperly has his hand up. So I imagine he's got something to say on behalf of the racial justice committee. Well, the board should uh, weigh in on this first, shouldn't they, Doug? The board should speak on this issue. Well, I, I'd be interested in uh, what, in, in from Rick, what the perceived need is, you know, a, a description of that, and then weigh in after that. Okay, well, I would just uh, say that I would even, I would support it before I even heard anything from anybody, so. Okay. okay. Actually, I like Mike's sentiment. I'd like to hear the board and then I'd like to uh, make a comment after that, if that's fine. Sure, Mike. I support it. I, I think it's a great idea. Uh, if you, a lot of times, if you, like you alluded to it in the beginning, uh, that it's hard for uh, people to kind of run a meeting and then have somebody within a meeting, try to have a sense of the meeting. And a lot of times uh, in that case, uh, minutes will come out cursory uh, to say the least. And so if you have somebody that's dedicated to take the minutes to these meetings, we get a full and concise reading on actually what happened during the meeting. Kyle? Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, uh, it's really important to, um, <clears throat> to also support our committees in this way. I mean, they're, it's hard enough to show up and do the work um, as active committee members. Um, I don't think they need the additional stress of trying to be minute takers as well. So I think it's, I'm in support of it. The one question I have is um, uh, where in our budget does money, I forget, do we have a line that is specifically for minute taking and do we have we don't have we have a we don't have a line for it that is not already spoken for. Uh, we have a line for it uh, for you know the DRB for the planning commission uh, who we have provided minute takers for in the past. Uh, we don't have a line item for minute taking for these two groups. Um, I don't believe the cost will be too high. I believe that we can afford it uh, if we so desire. Matt? I agree with all that's been said. I just, I wanna, um, I, I also think we, if we approve this, we need to be prepared for other town committees to come forward and ask for the same. And that, would start to add up to something we can't afford mid budget. You know, so we should have some sort of distinction for you know when do we provide it and when don't we provide it. Yeah, we have. Uh, I would bring up that we have on our agenda not a minute taker, but the historical society looking for administrative help. Yeah, and and I think. Um, the rec committee could also use some minute taking support as well. So um, but these but but these are the two committees that have come forward tonight. So we should figure that out. 
these are the these are the two committees that have come forward for minute for minute takers. The for, yeah, at the, for this meeting. And the historical society is asking for administrative help. Okay. So I my my opinion is that uh, it's really important for these uh, organizations to have a record, and because without it, it just evaporates into the atmosphere, and they don't know what they said previously or who said what. And I think it's really important that they have it. So I'm in favor of this. Yeah, and I would just add, especially in this COVID Zoom meeting land, <laughs> um, the more you know transparent and communicative we can be and get that information out to folks, the better. So is there a motion or uh, how, how would uh, one, how would we proceed with this? It looks like there's potential sharing, one between municipalities, another between the town and the village. So I think a motion, we might take these up as two separate motions. Uh, or we can get it done in one kind of wordy motion. Um, and then we do have a couple members of the public that would like to comment, but I think probably the best for us is to get a motion on the floor for discussion. Let's do that. So moved, Mr. Chairman. There we have minute professional minute takers for the Racial Justice Committee and also the Law Enforcement Study Committee. Are we going to seek uh, 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 cost sharing for? Exactly. They throw that in too. Hey, I was thinking while I was doing it that uh, we actually are going to have a joint meeting with the trustees in the near future, and it might be that might be the place to discuss it uh, to try to get on board with them at the same time versus us going ahead with it and then hoping they jump on board. Uh, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about it or not. Do we want to try to go it alone and try to force the issue with them or do we want them to partner with us and to make it like it was both our ideas? You know, it's kind of slight dilemma there. Don't you think it's an idea whose time has come that it would be just as well to present it to them as that this is what we would we're proposing and they hope they would uh, agree. Sure, I don't mind doing that. So I made the motion, I guess you're gonna have to have a second for it. Yeah, with with uh, what Brian yeah. had said in the basic- Co Cost sharing. Cost sharing per rata. I'll second that. Any further discussion? We board. do have some members of the public who are ready to comment if the board's all set. Okay, let's go with the public. Okay, uh, Scott, I see your hand. Uh, I've got Rick and Beth up first and then I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, Rick. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Um, first of all, um, I would like to in principle uh, like to be in congruence as much as possible with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and their open meeting law requirements. And as such, um, I support a transparent, objective, and impartial assessment and transcription of the Racial Justice Committee meeting and that's why I'm really um, uh, I'm hoping the board will recommend uh, that uh, maybe we could use Donna G's services. Uh, I, I am a student of the minutes as some people may have discovered recently um, but I do believe that uh, the reason that you um, approve the minutes at every meeting is that people do look at them and do look for consistencies and inconsistencies and make them part of the public record. So I would really like it um, if the board would consider uh, the request from, from, I guess, both committees, but I, I think it's important to maybe make them two separate motions because you do have uh, 
separate, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, um, financial uh, concerns. Um, but that's up to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. All right, and Beth. Okay, go ahead, Beth. Um, my initial thought was similar to Nat's that if you open this up for two committees that are new committees, you're gonna have existing committees who want all the same things, which is appropriate, but it really needs to be unbiased in the way that that is allocated. So if you approve it for some, I would just caution you, you should really approve it for all. And then also um, there are some technologies out there and I believe Zoom is one of them with a paid license that will give you a transcript from the recording. So you don't have to actually have a minute taker. You can get a transcript. It doesn't always, I've seen the output of the transcripts. It gets the words correct most of the time. You do need someone just to look them over quickly. It doesn't always assign the right person's name in terms of who is speaking. But if you are looking for an unbiased um, minute taker who is not going to take any liberties and is going to be consistent, I would just encourage that you use a transcription service such as one that um, Zoom or another technology offers for all of the committees. It would save money also. You may have to pay a licensing fee that's annual. However, that would um, still cost, I would imagine, significantly less than the hours that go into all of our committees. We have a lot of dedicated committee members on a lot of different committees for our town. And I just would caution the board to vote thinking about all of committee members, um, not just one or two groups. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. All right, uh, Scott. Hey, everybody. So uh, for linking the two together um, for the racial justice in the law enforcement committee, the village trustees, I don't think the village has any game in it for the law enforcement committee. So I would caution about doing this as one, one motion. Um, that's the first thing. And I also want to echo what Beth had said. Um, I do think that we need to take really good notes from this committee, the racial justice committee. But I'm also wondering about um, IT use for um, verbal to a written transcript and how that would work. Um, I haven't seen transcripts come off of Zoom. Um, I have seen other devices use. <clears throat> Sometimes it's spotty and doesn't really, <coughs> excuse me, capture <clears throat> what was said. Um, I can't speak on the behalf of the trustees, obviously, but um, I, I think, you know, I would support it as a trustee, but um, I can't speak for everybody else. But um, yeah, please split the two apart um, because the trustees don't really have any say or committee members or any kind of um, involvement with the uh, law enforcement committee. That's a town gig and a town contract. Thank you. My understanding of the motion, and I I didn't make the motion, maybe I should shut up. My understanding of the motion is that the cost share would be for the racial justice committee only with the village, but for the law enforcement committee where the village doesn't have skin in the game, it would be shared with the other two towns, not with the village. Am I wrong about that, Mike? No. That's what I understood also. Yeah. Likewise. Is there any further discussion? I've got another comment from Rick, if you're. OK. OK, Rick, go ahead. Um, and I guess um, I was just going to add to what Scott said that uh, we will be asking the village trustees uh, for support at, at their next meeting. We've only had one meeting and it was uh, informal and informational. And we have a meeting coming up on Thursday night. So I appreciate the select board uh, considering this, um, given that we, we do have a meeting coming up uh, on Thursday. Thank you. 
Okay. Mr. Sure. Chairman? Yes. This uh, vote is basically just for what the motion and second is. We haven't decided who any minute taker is going to be. No, well, that's correct. Uh, that's so correct. Presumably, we would hire as competent people as we could find. Right. And so we need to get into the weeds on that to do a little bit of a cost analysis uh, about what Beth was talking about, a transcript from Zoom, how much that would cost versus how much a, an individual uh, would cost. So are we just going to move forward uh, in concept with the uh, minute taker and then decide on who's going to take the minutes at a later time or what is the pleasure of the chairman? Well, my, my understanding is the motion as it stands doesn't have any designation of who the taker would be. That's correct. Whether it be IT or, or not, we are just going to uh, procure a taker. So uh, is there any other discussion? If my only other um, comment is just making sure that the that when we look into who does this, if the transcript is, you know, if the VLCT is, you know, we use that as a legit um, way of documenting our, our meetings. Yeah, uh, we had, uh, it was recreation, and I don't know if Beth or Lisa was on rec at the time, uh, or Nat for that matter, uh, but REC had tried to use transcription services from a recording device and found it pretty unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that just doing a recording and then going to the transcription service, it was very difficult for it to get the person right. And it ended up taking a lot of editing time. Right. Uh, and then I, out. yeah. Zoom could be a lot better. I, I don't have any experience with it, uh, but given that the technology for Zoom already has to track all of us separately, it might do a really good job of assigning the person who spoke to the right person, which was the big failure of using a recording, uh, like a, just a traditional tape recording. I see Lisa appeared. Does she have something to say? No? Okay. Uh, Diana Osborne has a, a comment of her Okay, go ahead, Diana. Um, I, as a member of the law enforcement committee study group, I feel like I would get minimum, minimal value from a transcript of a meeting. After the fact, it would be an enormous amount of information that was irrelevant to have to plow through. And I think that um, a transcript would not meet my needs. And I'd rather make the effort to um, just take the minimum amount of notes required legally and do minutes that way than um, have a word for word transcript to plow through after the fact. That's a good point. That's a good point, Diana. Yeah, thank you, Diana. All right. I, I also have to say, I, I, our meetings are also, um, it's very easy to record uh, Zoom meetings. Um, so I, um, I see all of the points that people make about the, the importance of, of good minutes, and I'm not against that, but I don't think that we really um, have a full understanding of what exactly this would cost us, especially once other committees start, start asking for it. So I think I'm going to probably vote no on this for that reason. Okay. Lois. Okay, Lois, you'll have to unmute. There we go. I just want to add that as far as I understand, recording and having minutes as um, the same as the agenda is a part of the open meeting law, which is required and is based um, while VLTC has great information about it, but I think it's a legislative mandate. Uh, that that we follow open meeting law guidelines. 
Yes, so. uh, th that is true. Uh, it is a requirement of us to have both a recording and minutes uh, of all meetings that are held electronically. Well, all meetings of the community. I mean, uh, the recording isn't a requirement for in person meetings, uh, but minutes and uh, minutes are required for every meeting. Right. Uh, the recording is just a new thing now that we're meeting electronically. And that's and that's separate from what we're discussing here. The, the, the baseline expectation is that all committees are going to follow the open meeting law. And the, the minutes required in the open meeting law are pretty minimal. It's, it's, you know, attendance, who was there, when the meeting was, when it started, when it ended, and any major motions that were carried during the meeting, I believe. I might have one or two things missing. But no, the, that's pretty much it. The meeting, the minutes can be very minimal. Um, and I understand that there are sacrifices for that, um, reasons that we don't want them to be super minimal. Um, but this isn't about whether we follow the open meeting law or not. It's whether we pay somebody to, to give us um, minutes for the, for the. Mr. Chairman. Yep. I, I can attest to that as a trustee. Many years ago, we would have meetings that would last three or four hours and it would be relegated to one page, basically. They, it, uh, to use the word, they were cursory to say the least, but they still followed the rule of the law. They still were legal and everything else, but did they tell you really much what actually happened? No, uh, but what we've been doing lately uh, with our professional minute taker, we have a, a narrative and it's very good for everybody to uh, refer to that from time to time to figure out exactly what the true sense of the meeting was. Uh, but to get back to what Nat said, uh, he does make a good point. Uh, we're going to open up Pandora's box here, and he didn't quite allude to it, but I can see what other people have said, that everybody's going to want a professional minute taker. Uh, so possibly we should actually look into this to see how we can fund it and how much it's going to cost us and how much we've been paying for our minutes uh, that we have. So, I mean, there's some things that we need to look at. And Brian had mentioned that we don't really have a line item for this. Correct, Brian? Not for other committees. We have a line item for the committees that we currently pay for, which is just the DRB, the Planning Commission, and the Select Board. Correct. Which the thinking there is those three committees have statutory obligations under Vermont state law. Yes, significant mm -hmm. statutory obligations that it would not, it's not unreasonable to expect that those committees might end up in court. So the minutes that we receive from Donna are, are, are very high quality, excellent minutes uh, that really, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the, the minutes that Donna provides for us. Um, and yeah, th there's an argument to be made to provide that for all of our committees, uh, but in between budget cycles, we could not afford that for everyone. Um, yeah, the flip side is if some of these smaller committees, um, you know, are able to provide the legally binding information and then people are interested in more, maybe we would see more local participation in our meetings. Yeah. And Mike, were you going to say something that I missed your uh, This may be the first time that I've ever made a motion that I might vote against. Uh, the, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm in 100% agreement uh, with the motion I made in the concept, but paying for it is another story. And uh, I think that we need to step back a little bit and decide how we're gonna pay for it before we vote it in. So any more discussion? Um, I've got a public comment from Rick. Okay. Okay. okay ahead, um, thank you. And, and I don't mean to belabor the point. Um, but I think um, uh, where I work, 
um, we work with a lot of conflict resolution and uh, we, we do it on a case by case basis usually. Um, and I um, appreciate that the board is considering that many of these committees may be coming forward and wanting professional minute takers. But I would also like to say that at this point, and I think Brian spoke to it, um, we're sort of in between the budget here. And um, on a case by case basis, I think the select board could approve and could work through some of the details. Mike, I'm in agreement with you as well, um, that this is something that should be budgeted for in the long term. Uh, because I think that going forward, given um, uh, how to say it, the social media context of which we are now holding a majority of our public meetings, uh, I think clarity is really important. And um, I, I, I just have to uh, reiterate that I think Donna does an, an excellent job of providing uh, the clarity of the of the meeting in her minute taking, and so um, again, maybe just consider it on a case by case basis as you look uh, to a longer term solution. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess my comment would be that I think that these committees are the law enforcement study committee will be making a report and i think that their what their minutes will be very important to the to the uh um in town meeting and i think the racial justice committee is calling out and needs one of these uh mm -hmm. records there there's absolutely a need for a record from this committee you know? mm -hmm. i understand the slippery slope but uh, i would you know i would pitch this as, as essential um so any other comments? No, so I don't have the last comment. Yeah, I was gonna say that I, I agree that I think, um, you know, these two committees are before us right now. This is what who we're addressing. Um, and I, I think we, and I think it's incredibly important that both these committees have very good notes as soon as possible. So um, I, I think if we can find the money for these two committees now, I think we should move forward with it. Okay, we've, uh, let's go on to uh, a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And I'd vote aye also. Uh, no? No. You've got to take a roll call now anyway, so it's going to give me a minute to stall and consider it. <laughs> like I said before, I agree with it, but I think we got to wait like a couple of weeks until we find the money to do it and have it all uh, kosher. Right. Well, it's well, not really not too much to ask, but. So, um, Kyle? Aye. Mike? Nay. Matt? Aye. And I'll vote aye. Let the minutes reflect, Mr. Chairman, that I would have voted for it if we had funding for it that was on the table, direct funding for this. Good. I'm sure Donna will record that. And okay. thank, you for, thank you for stating that. Um, so let's go to the healthcare cost increases. Yes. So uh, pretty short, uh, but we may have a larger discussion. Uh, basically, the healthcare cost increases are a little bit more modest. They're considerably more modest this year than they were last year, uh, with a, an increase of 2.4% for our benchmark plan. Um, if you recall, we used the Blue Cross Blue Shield Gold Plan to set our cost sharing standard with employees. Uh, and that plan has risen by only 2.4% this year. Uh, so that is much better than the uh, roughly 10% we saw last year. Uh, so that leaves us with a little bit more free hand uh, for 
making decisions about compensation and health care uh, contribution this year. Is that short and sweet? Uh, it looks like Mike's got a comment. What's the cost per employee? Uh, that's a little bit hard to say. Because average? Do you have an average like we've always had? I don't have our complete report out right now. I'm planning on that for our joint meeting. Okay. But um, I'd say most of our plans. No, I packed. Sorry, I'm working from home tomorrow, so I, I packed that up. Uh, that paperwork up to take home with me. Um, but most of our employees are on the two-person plan, so it's. Yeah, it, it's going to be probably an average uh, around nine hundred dollars a person per month. Per month. Yes. Yep. That can be. It's over ten thousand dollars a year. That's right. I, yeah, I believe that's. Uh, I'm looking at last year. That's five dollars an hour. <laughs> Welcome to America, Mike. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, Mike, it's it's quite a bit higher than that. Yeah. Uh, last year we were paying. Uh, about seventeen thousand dollars a person. And you say it's going to go up to ten thousand dollars? No, it, it's going to go up by about two point four percent. So it's going to go. Oh, up. oh okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I get you. Okay, so we'll be talking about this in part at a joint meeting, right? Because yeah, this is really to, to kind of start the conversation and start thinking about it. Um, so if we don't have a lot more comment about that directly, then uh, the next piece in our agenda uh, is kind of the first application of this is that we're going to have to uh, meet to discuss uh, for the for Susan and Rosemary, uh, our town clerk and assistant town clerk who are paid jointly by the town and village. Okay. Um, Related to this, it's also worthwhile uh, to think about our commitment to keeping uh, costs equal for office employ for all office employees. That's been a priority for the board in the past, um, and uh, a little more detail about that. Uh, the trustees had asked. Uh, Meredith and Gordy to meet with Eric and myself uh, to draw up some of the reports that we'll have and some of the, you remember we usually bring a couple models of what the cost impact will be uh, to that meeting. Um, with Gordy and Eric out of town, Rosemary, Meredith and myself met and uh, worked out a couple scenarios that I'll bring for the uh, that both Meredith and I will bring for the, the joint meeting. Before we go into talking about joint meeting, um, I had, uh, Nat had made a request that I've ignored about early in the meeting having a COVID update. So I'd, I'd like to do that now if we could. Okay. She said, forgotten about that. Um, yeah, I, I made, I mean, pretty much. What I wanted to say, I, I made into a front porch forum post, and it's it's out today. But the the emergency management team met today um, with a couple of our senior members away at, at hunting camp. But um, we we met in mostly in response to the governor's uh, latest order, which said that uh, to the maximum extent possible. Um, 
municipal governments should reinstitute telecommunity telecommuting or work from home procedures. Um, and um, so I think, and maybe Brian, you'll be able to speak to this more clearly, but we have uh, our, our office staff now will work um, alternating days, different days uh, in, in smaller groups, um, socially distanced with masks and the, the uh, municipal building access continues to be restricted for essential business only, uh, by appointment only. Um, and our um, highway crew, um, you know, I think we, we asked them to not share vehicles. Um, otherwise, the work they're doing is already pretty socially distant. So, uh, and we're not able to, to have them work in shifts at this point. Did I cover that pretty well, Brian, or what did I miss? I think you covered that pretty well. Um, yeah, the the essential business for access to the municipal building is going to be pretty strict. Um, you know, things like uh, you know we're going to make greater use of you know if you need documents and you let us know, uh, we can put the documents out for you. Um, we'll make everything available as best we can, but interior access to the building is going to be uh, more highly restricted than it had been and it was already uh, you know, not a high level of access. Uh, we're going back to working uh, in teams so that we've got uh, two separate teams of office staff. So on any given day, you should be able to receive most services by phone. Uh, but with fewer people in the office, you might have to leave a voicemail or something a little bit more often. Uh, you might get callbacks the other day uh, for certain individuals if you need to speak to, you know, Anne in particular, you know, she'll be in every other day or Marla will be in every other day or whoever you need to talk to. Um, and yeah, we're going to make greater use of dropping documents and having documents outside rather than coming inside to pick them up. Um, our, yeah, the highway crew, it's more uh, refocusing and a, and a renewed commitment to uh, respiratory practices. Uh, they, they've never really been able to stand down in, in quite the same way, so. So 34, I think 34 cases reported in Lowell County in the last two weeks and, and um, between one and five uh, cases reported in Johnson very recently. So um, it's here and we want to just convey that to the public as much as possible that this needs to be taken seriously and masking and social distancing and limit your Thanksgiving um, gathering plans and all of that. So that's it. Thank you. There's not going to be much Thanksgiving gathering plans, really. Not supposed to be any. Exactly. Yeah. No, the, the governor's made uh, yeah, a, a pretty uh, a, a significant request for this, and, and we're doing our best to comply with it. And we, we hope that uh, all the, the residents of Johnson feel the same way. Uh, puts a wrench in our works. We have 60 in our house usually. Yeah. It's going to be different this year. Isn't that the truth? Okay. Thank you, Nat. Um, so I had pulled us out of the, uh, the heading. We're heading into the discussion of scheduling and agenda for the joint meeting. Yes. And so what, what date are they? Can we quickly cut to what date and see whether that would work for people? November 23rd is going to kind of be our, our I don't know what's going to be best for everybody's schedules, but it's going to be a good day for us to meet uh, and come to an agreement that we can give to employees about health care and allow them a good amount of time to make their health care selections for next year. So that is next Monday? Yes. How would that work for... Kyle, Mike, Matt. 
Yeah, I already. I, said, I, I already okay, yeah, Kyle. I think you sent me a, a note replying, but yeah, I didn't catch the time. Did we decide six or seven? Uh, trustees always prefer six. Yeah, I can yeah. actually do six on Mondays. I can't on the other days, but okay. So they're going to have an early meeting because they have to go to bed early. I'm sure. Can I make a pitch for an agenda item for, for that meeting? Yeah, that would be the next subject is 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 to uh, to solicit agenda items from the board. So why Sorry. Don't you off. Sorry to jump the gun there, uh, but if we could review maintenance needs for jointly owned properties, um, including the cold storage building, um, including the uh, scout house, including the um, municipal building, I think that would be valuable. Okay. Are we yet in a position to re uh, talk about the merger study or no? Good question. Uh, I can I can put a call out to a uh, consultant again and ask for an update. Mike? The way we're fiddling around with this merger study, uh, probably they're talking about no town meeting except by ballot. Uh, Probably the best thing to do would be to put that merger study uh, out at the town meeting ballot and it would save a mailing. We have to, if they're going to pay for our, for us to mail ballots, I don't know if they would uh, appreciate it if we packed in some extra mail for that to save costs on our end. Wouldn't hurt to ask. Yeah. You know, everybody knows what a cheapskate I am, so the last vote should prove that. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, why we, not? You know, that could be actually on that ballot. Well, well we can discuss it at, uh, right, at a joint meeting, but okay. that would be that, a good that, way to save some money. That could be in a, you know, find out what you can and, and you could bring that forward at at, at that joint meeting. Okay. I'm following up on what Nat said. I, I think that as far as municipal buildings from reading the minutes, uh, the village garage is a actually a town and village owned building. And uh, I think that uh, there, it looks, sounds like there might be some quite exceptional costs involved at that point. And we ought to, it, it was a subject of uh, the area-wide brownfields. Um, and I, I think that uh, there ought to be, I don't know how, Brian, do you have any dis suggestions how to, this, what portion of that might be studied or talked about? Um, not too concretely, but I, I think that's a good topic for, for the meeting that, uh, you know that that had been something that came up in the the brownfield study, and it wasn't practical. It didn't seem practical at the time uh, to repurpose that site. But before we invest, or before they invest a, a significant amount of money, it's maybe worth a discussion. What are you thinking about, Doug? Uh, combining two built one two buildings into one. Oh, no, I, I have no idea. Uh, all I know is that I, I read the minutes. Did you read this, the trustee minutes? The which, trustee, which one? Uh, the most recent ones where they, where their people are, the building, it sounds like it's a sick building with black mold and, uh, and needs to be almost destroyed or build a new wall inside and uh, completely, uh, uh, Scott had uh, information on it. He's, he's back up. Glad Maybe, you woke up, Scott. Yeah, Scott, can you uh, give us some definition on this, or what what sort of an issue you might be looking at? What's the scale? Um, scale is bad, and uh, just because we are in a public meeting where things are being recorded, um, I'd not like to use the word black mold. Um, there's no mold samples taken. It's 
basically health department and department of labor protocol. Um, not the sample for mold, um, because if you see it, you have it. And the best way to deal with it is remove the water source, remove the contaminated building material, which is throughout the building. So to do it correctly, it's roof repair and a gut for the building to remove all of it and start from the studs up and rebuild it. It's huge. There are some band-aids that you can do to alleviate some of those issues. And I promised um, Meredith, um, I would try to come up with a few ideas to get us through um, based on my background. Uh, it's, yeah, it needs work. And I'm not sure what the cost would be. It's gonna be pricey. And I'm not really clear on what the other buildings on site have um, for air quality and uh, mold buildup within the building structure. Um, yeah, but if we can refrain from using the terminology of black mold, it's, it's a media thing. It's not really based really well in science. And I, I'd rather not go down that road. But is the a, building does a... have visible mold and wet wet insulation and sheetrock and dripping roofs and it's it's in need of repair thank you scott no. if, mike sorry when i just mentioned that about having a building for two uh, two entities in one building uh, we all know uh, even going down to the town garage it is kind of it's not the best in the world either. Uh, it's very tight in there uh, for all of our vehicles. Uh, I, I would think that it would be better if we had a study or something and uh, possibly went through Energy Efficiency Vermont looking for money, uh, looking for grant money, looking for efficiencies uh, uh, in, in our resources to look into building one big building for both departments. Uh, There'd be energy savings. There'd be all kinds of savings without duplication of services. And right. so even if uh, there was a merger study and let's say th it was a merger study to the, to the fact that the town and the village did merge, you still would have to have a space for the water and light department. So it would not be totally lost nothing would be lost. I think you would see a gain in the long run uh, in, in 10, 20 years with efficiencies. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge conversation. Uh, if we're looking at it, I mean, we can do a tear out of where the village is now. We still have um, the slab of the building and I would pretty much bet a hundred bucks that it doesn't have a vapor barrier on the floor, so it's gonna be wicking moisture up, still bringing moisture into the building, still creating issues. It's at this point, um, there's a few loose ends and one is the merger study and do we merge or not? Ownership of the building, how this all works, is it more doable to have one building start from scratch, do a bond um, for a rebuild it you know that site is sort of an eyesore and a little chaotic um that's my personal opinion um when you're going down the rail trail it looks like an old factory site because that's what it is yeah. um it's not the most graceful introduction into our village for rail trail users whether it be summer or winter users um, or folks going to top mill park it deserves a good conversation in either path that we take it's gonna be expensive. It's not cheap to gut out a metal building, get it properly vented. Um, you know, steel buildings with that kind of insulation build, it was sort of a, a good idea, but science-wise and health-wise, a horrible idea. Um, and we have most of our employees, village and town, in that kind of structure. Um, there's a little bit of ownership for occupational risk, 
Um, most mold exposures are based on the person's immune system. Some people can handle it, some people can't. There's no standards for mold. So we can't say, oh, you're over so many, um, you know, the spore count is too high according to an occupational standard because there is none. This is where indoor air quality um, regarding mold gets really, really dicey. Uh, workers' comp claims get really, really dicey. Um, and it's unfortunate that we have found ourselves um, in this situation. <clears throat> There's really, really good information on CDC's webpage. Uh, EPA has really good information on moldy buildings. Most of the recommendations from EPA has a timeline for wet building materials and stuff within the building. And we're way over that. I mean, a lot of the times it's a 24 hour period, sometimes up to a week, depending on the building material. This has been, you know, years in the making. So nothing in there for building material with the exception of the steel after it's cleaned um, is really salvageable with all the trainings and experience I've had in the past, it sort of paints a bleak picture. Um, sorry to be a, a downer on the conversation, but it is what it is. Now, you think, you know, as, as the village meeting minutes alluded to, uh, we are very possibly um, headed towards the same path with the cold storage building yeah. uh, that has, has some water issues. So um, but I, I guess uh, for background at another meeting, I would like to know what the arrangement is with town and village, who owns, who actually owns the, the buildings and what has the maintenance agreement been on the two buildings yeah. over the years. So I, um, I think there's some nuance there that we should, we should understand before we make decisions. Yeah. And would that be in the transfer of the property that was done to the town and the village. Uh, I'm sure there's wording in there for the legal documents for land transfer and the brownfield itself. What I'm wondering, unfortunately, I think it, it's probably gonna be a no-go, but a lot of brownfields, there's development money for rehabbing brownfields. Um, not really quite clear if it would fit the bill. Um, but it might be worth looking at to see if there's any kind of money that we could get um, through a brownfield project to uh, clean it up. Um, not sure if moldy buildings fits into the brownfield. It's usually more inherent pollution from the previous user. Um, but it might be worth a, a look between Brian and Meredith sort of digging into that one. Um, Meredith has had some interesting work with our village powerhouse and the brownfields program. Um, that one was easy because, you know, village power created that mess. Um, this we sort of inherited. So there might be some wiggle room um, in securing funding for cleanup. We can look at that. There's also some funding. I know that we came across it when we were looking at Parker and Stearns and assistance for Parker and Stearns in Manchester is that there's some funding available uh, for a new developer. Uh, so that if we really go down the uh, path recommended by the Brownfield Committee about redeveloping that property away from uh, our municipal resources, and relocating facilities someplace else that we might be able to access some money with that uh, at redeveloping it for a new purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my recollection from being on that Brownfields committee was that the consultants recommended that that be the first area that we that we consider redeveloping for just because it is such a prime location for um, economic development and the rail trail. Um, and the fact that we already own that property versus trying to get a private property owner to sort of yeah. buy into buy into the project. So um, who knows, maybe there's some silver linings here, <laughs> let's hope. Yeah, there's some interesting options there. Um, 
I know the village's needs uh, was to have something accessible to downtown. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, no, I, I, it sounds like this is something that we should discuss with the village rather than just yes. putting Scott on the, uh, the hot seat to speak for the village. Yeah. I had a discussion today with Leah. Um, she ran the uh, LCPC Brownfields uh, Committee, that, which was an advisory committee that uh, uh, proposals from various uh, owners and communities, sometimes from, something might come in from St. Johnsbury. If we had excess funds got placed, I was the town's liaison on that. And uh, Leah said that uh, they did not make an application for a Brownfields grant, which is this October. Uh, but some, you know, I think that she would be a very good person to involve in a discussion like this because of her, because of her knowledge and, and because of the fact that uh, that, that an, a, an application could be made in, in the future um, on this. So I, I would suggest that uh, she would add a lot of information to uh, a joint meeting if this, if this was to be a subject. Good suggestion. So I'm yeah. gonna suggest this as a topic to Meredith uh, with the suggestion that Leah be invited as a guest speaker on this topic. Okay, any other agenda items for, for our joint meeting? Or these are these are suggested items to be nego agenda items to be negotiated out. I guess you know. Yeah, yeah. We we don't we don't set the agenda our, by ourselves. It, it's uh, it's going to be a little bit tough because it's going to be uh, vice chairs setting the agenda uh, because Gordy and Eric will not be available uh, before we need to post the agenda. Oh, you mean it's me? Yep. Oh, that's wonderful, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> and Doug, I can do that with you because I am vice chair when Gordy's not around. Oh, OK. Or chair, oh. I guess. Or what, are, what do you call yourself, an alternate? Oh, I'm going, I'm alternate. Alternate, Doug. The yeah, alternate, I, I can be alternate, Scott. OK, I was thinking I could go to deer camp, too. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. No, then that's, who's, that's, the, then yeah. who's the chairman uh, then? Uh, nah. uh, yeah, you're you're still uh, officer, you know, whatever it is of the piece. No, whatever. Um, so let's, let's move on to the. Uh, can we move on to the item six? No, um, that I don't want to do that. I want to go to Mike and his October 2020 sheriff report before we. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Before we start doing executive session. Yeah. So Mike. I would uh, just like to uh, go to the October 2020 uh, monthly report and kind of read into the minutes uh, that uh, traffic tickets written, traffic warnings written. Uh, Hyde Park had 13 uh, tickets written, 19 warnings. Johnson had five tickets written, 26 warnings. Wilkett had five tickets written, five warnings. Uh, Elmore had one ticket and three warnings. Hyde Park had five arrests. Johnson had seven. Wolcott had zero. That was it. Okay. Um, so is there anything, have I missed any agenda items that were added? The Historical Society, we haven't yes. talked about that. Can you so, uh, check that out briefly? Yeah, the Historical Society uh, it has experiencing, I, I'd say they're experiencing some uh, growing pains. Uh, they have a lot of projects that they could do, that they'd like to do, but they're kind of reaching the limit of what they can accomplish with just volunteers. So they would like uh, some staff time. And in speaking with Duncan, I had mentioned that uh, Lisa Cruz is, because so much of REC is canceled, uh, Lisa has stepped up to assist in a number of other ways and has been a terrific asset for the town, but uh, is still down a little bit on hours from what we had uh, asked her to, to commit to uh, for the position. So 
if the board is willing and, uh, you know, I assume we would probably also want Lisa's input on this. Uh, but if we're willing, we might assign uh, some of Lisa's time to assisting the historical society. Uh, it's outside of her job description, so that would have to be a modification. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it is with time budget. We are under budget for for Lisa's estimated time. So, what does the select board think of this, members? I thought the uh, historical society is kind of supposed to take care of themselves. Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but um, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I think I know what you mean by that, but I think it could also be misinterpreted. It's getting late. Um, Yeah, I, I, I think um, I wouldn't want to leave it open ended. I think I'd want some specifics on exactly kind of project scope time, how long, that sort of thing. And I also want to be aware that um, the, the, again, the law enforcement um, committee had asked if there were staff resources available to help them out. Um, so again, there'll be there are possibly other committees that um, would, would want um, staff time. It's just a, an awareness thing. That's not to say that this is deserving or not. It's just to be aware that other committees are going to be asking for similar things, potentially. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I, I guess I agree with Nat that I think it would be pretty important to make sure that we are clear about timeline, when and if things hopefully get back up and running, that Lisa's not in the middle of project with the historical society and then can't do the recs. You know, I don't know. I um, So, yeah, I guess I would need clarification on 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 some of those details and how that, how we navigate that. So, Lisa, what does it look like from your side? Was that uh, sorry, Doug? I missed the beginning of that question. Oh, I was actually wondering from Lisa's point of view what this would look like or what she thinks of this. I I feel like I'm happy to help with whoever needs it here and there, um, hoping to really develop the multi-use hiking and potential mountain bike trail system that um, Walter started uh, last year down on the Tal Talc Mill property because I think that is a huge asset to our community and I can't think of a time otherwise that I would be able to plan it around skiing and uh, basketball and all that. And I'd like to develop some new rec stuff while we have a little bit of downtime because the development seems to be the time consuming part and then sort of running it year over year gets easier. Um, but, I, but I'd be happy to help here and there as needed. Okay. So it sounds like maybe what we wanna do is ask Historical Society if they have some specific requests uh, with timelines associated with them. I think so. And then we can either approve or not approve of the of that request, but that we are, we are open to hearing more details if they want to develop them. Okay, I, I think we should ask. Uh, you know, it sounded like Lisa had uncommitted time, but but you know, it it may not be the case. She may be doing really important work right now and laying groundwork. So I think we need to look at that aspect too. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I could have the wrong impression. I could still be looking for, you know, more work to give her and she's done an excellent job of, of uh, kind of building out rec and like she said, finding development time and other things that uh, regular service makes it 
a challenge. So. Okay. Uh, I, I, is that enough direction to? Uh, I feel like that's enough direction for me. Okay. Uh, other members of the select board? Yeah. Fine with me. If Nat got rid of his elbow, we could see if he's agreeing or not agreeing. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, if, if I went to uh, number six, would I be skipping anything? No, I think we're ready for that. Okay, so this is a question of an executive session to discuss ongoing negotiations of the improved Lamoille Valley Rail Trail building and naming rights. Is there a, a motion with regard to that? Make a motion we go into this under 1 VSA 313A1. Second. To discuss ongoing negotiations for the improved Lamoille Valley Rail Trail building and naming rights. And that was Nat's second. Okay. Yes. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, did I, I didn't hear a nay, did I? I heard an aye right from that. Okay. Um, I'm going to step away for a second, Doug. I'll be right back. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, again, uh, the way we do executive session under Zoom. Uh, I'm going to remove everybody to the waiting room. Uh, you have the option of sticking around and then you'll just get brought back in or um, you can, you know, leave. Yes, Lisa. I've just been working on that um, Act 250 stuff around the trails in the park. And so it's like I'm happy to leave now, but could someone just update me tomorrow on what we come to a conclusion on on all that? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, um, you'll be re-added to the meeting later if you go to the waiting room. Um, but yeah, you've got a pretty good idea. We are going to do a little bit of business afterwards with regard to a decision about pursuing Act 250 uh, and permission from VTrans. So uh, I'm gonna move everybody out to the waiting room uh, beginning now. So I'll see you all shortly. Okay, it's 1014. We are consented out of executive session. The next mm -hmm. item on the uh, agenda is to discuss seeking an Act 250 amendment for the, uh, it says for Old Mill Park and work in the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail right of way. Uh, is that for the structure I presume that we're talking about? Yes, it is, is for the Trailhead? The Act 250 amendment would apply to the Old Mill Park parcel, but it is in it is specifically for improvements to the trailhead building. Okay, so that's the subject in front of us. Is there any discussion? Is there a motion or discussion on anything? So the motion should be uh, that we seek an Act 250 amendment for Old Mill Park and work in the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail right of way. Okay. Does There's that suffice? Yes. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Uh, just a, a little bit of clarity. Uh, we'll get the Act 250 permit from their office and for uh, the work in the rail trail right of way, uh, the request for that will go to uh, VTrans. Okay. As the right of way holder for the railway. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any negatives or abstentions? The ayes have it. Okay. Um, Lisa was on some other Act 250, but that was not her. She wanted an update on this because she is seeking an Act 250 
amendment for the bicycle trails uh, on another part of the same. Okay. I don't think it's going to be the same parcel, but it may be. Uh, so I will coordinate with Lisa and see if we want to file these as a single application uh, or not. Okay, uh, the next item eight is an executive session discuss an employee evaluation. Is there a motion? So move, Mr. Chairman. We go into executive session to discuss an employee evaluation as allowed by 1VSA 313A3. And it says for 20 minutes. So. Okay, boy. Uh, second? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, abstentions and or negatives, none. So the eyes, so we are in the executive session at 1017. Okay, well, we are out of executive session. It's about 1040, 43, something like that. I'm guessing at this 1043. point. 43. Okay. And uh, anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm sorry aye, I've been so long. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.